of my little ghouls and goblins. Have you ever wished you could go back in time? You know, maybe undo some of those awkward moments as a kid, try that grade 8 dance one more time, or maybe go forward and see what the future holds. I know I have. It's a shame that sort of tech only exists in the movies though, but what if it's already out there, just not of this world? Come, come my travelers. I'm Taylor, your casual crib keeper, and come step into the world of Top 5 Scary. It's bigger on the inside. We're gonna go 88 miles per hour hurtling forward as we take a look at the wild world of extraterrestrial time travel. This is Top 5 Time Travelers Who Might Be Aliens. Might be. With time travel, these stories can be a little much. But at the same time, you gotta admit they're fascinating. Let me know down below honestly if you think time travel is possible. No judgment from me, and be nice in the comments. Now let's dive on in. Number 5. Rudolph Fentz. Rudolph Fentz, as the story goes, was a man who was found dead in New York in 1951, but seemed as if that wasn't where he was meant to be, and he had got there by accident. Not geographically. Like, time-wise. Sorry, I'm still trying to work out my time puns, my time jokes. We'll hammer all those out in editing. At 11.15 on June 1951, a man dressed in 19th century attire was seen standing in the middle of the road on a busy New York street. None of the bystanders had seen how he'd arrived there, just that he looked out of sorts, disoriented, and confused. Before anyone could intervene, the man was fatally struck by a taxi. He didn't even have time to yell, I'm walking here. The story itself could stop here and would be an odd bit of New York history. But it was what was inside the man's pockets that only served to confuse this mystery even more. Let me list it off. On his person, Mr. Fence had a copper token for a beer worth five cents, bearing the name of an unknown saloon that even historians and locals couldn't identify. He had a bill for the care of a horse and the washing of a carriage, coming from a stable that wasn't listed in any address book. He had about $70 worth of vintage American banknotes, a business card with the name Rudolph Fence, bearing an address on Fifth Avenue, and a letter sent to this address address, dated 1876 from Philadelphia. And lastly, and maybe most confusingly, a medal for coming third in a three-legged race. Now, although they had a surprising amount of evidence to identify the man, they couldn't find anything. The captain of the missing persons desk of the NYPD, Hubert Rim, tried everything he could to positively ID this mystery cadaver. Going to the address printed, he found that no one knew who Rudolph Fence was. Eventually, he found a Rudolph Fence Jr. in a phone book from 1938, leading the captain to trace Fence Jr., only to discover that he had passed five years earlier, but that his widow had survived him. Interviewing the widow, Captain Rim learned that Fence's father, one Rudolph Fence Sr., had gone missing in 1876, aged 29, and had never been found. Huh. So what happened? Did Fence slip through a temporal portal? Was it intentional? Was he abducted by aliens through time and then dropped off at another completely disconnected point in human history? Maybe. I don't know. And my friends, if you want to experience time travel at home, I've actually perfected it. Listen to what you gotta do. First, you need to get comfy. Then you need to get a snack, maybe a drink too. And then you need to click on some top five scary videos. Now get really comfy, get the cat, get a blanket. Next thing you know, it's gonna be eight hours later because you are gonna be watching this stuff all day. Subscribe and tell me if my theory's right. Number four, the man from Torrid. Picture a regular day in Tokyo. It's summer, it's hot, it's sticky, it's July, and it's 1954, and a man is trying to enter Tokyo. He isn't particularly suspicious, he's conventional looking and fairly average, but he's denied entrance into Japan and detained by the authorities. His passport looks completely genuine and legitimate, with the exception that his passport lists his country of origin as Torrid, a country no one has ever been to because it doesn't exist. So was he just forging a fake passport? Well, this is where things get a bit interesting. When asked to point out where exactly Torrid was on the map, the man angrily insists that Torrid is exactly where Andorra is, the small landlocked country between France and Spain. He insisted that he'd never heard of Andorra, don't feel bad if you haven't, and that's where Torrid had been, and had been for the last thousand years. Now the Japanese officials detaining him were pretty confused, and they discovered that he had money from several different European countries on his person, and his passport, which other than the fact that it was from a country that doesn't exist, appeared totally genuine, and had been stamped several times already, even by Tokyo. The police were determined to get to the bottom of what it was they were dealing with, as they were more than a bit confused, wondering if they were experiencing the world's most elaborate prank, or perhaps there was something more to the story. They contacted the company he'd worked for, and the company claimed they had never heard of him before, even though the man from Torrid had several pages worth of documents proving his employment. The hotel he had a reservation for? 
Never heard of him. The company he was meeting in Tokyo? Never heard of him. After a while of investigations that were only turning up more questions than answers, police returned to his hotel room to release him, only to discover that the man had vanished. No one saw him leave the hotel, and there was no way he could have escaped from the window, as the hotel room was nearly on the top floor and there were no balconies. In the years succeeding, there have been all kinds of rumors and speculations as to just what the man from Torrid was. Some have put forward that he could have been a time traveler. It's definitely possible. Another prevailing theory is that he's a man from a different timeline or a different reality altogether, who somehow fell into this one. With this line of thinking, is it unreasonable to consider that the man from Torrid wasn't from this world at all? Could he have been a visitor from another planet? Could Torrid have been the name of his planet? Our visitor's true home? I mean, maybe. Number three, John Teeter. John Teeter is the name of a man who claimed he had traveled back in time during the 2000s. Kind of an odd time to travel back in time to, unless maybe you're hatching a complicated scheme to invest in Bitcoin. Anyway, Teeter made his post on the Time Travel Institute forum, where he claimed to be a soldier from the far off year of 2036. So we've got about 12 years to see if any of what he claimed is right, although mild spoiler warning, he's been wrong for most of it. Regardless, let's take a look together. He claims that he had been sent back in time as part of a US government operation to the year 1976, where Mr. Teeter was sent back to recover an IBM 5100 computer as it was essential to debugging something in his timeline or something, some time travel stuff. Now, th there's a lot more working against Mr. Teeter being a time traveler than there is evidence working for him. Foremost, that a lot of his predictions for the future ended up being totally bogus. For one, he claimed there would be a civil war in the United States in the year 2005. The civil war would grow so much into such an unstoppable force that the United States would split up into five main regions and eventually the dissolution of the states would lead into World War III starting in 2015. Now, 2015 is kind of a blur for me. That's when I started college. I don't really remember a lot of it, but I don't remember World War III happening. Although Teeter himself posited that because he traveled back in time, he created a new time stream caused by this disruption, and therefore any of his predictions could end up not coming true in this altered state. It kind of sounds like an excuse to me, Mr. Teeter, but what do I know? I'm not a time traveler. I can't remember if this follows the rules they set in Avengers Endgame or not. Now, true believers and fair skeptics, is it all possible that the reason Mr. Teeter set himself backwards in time, because he wasn't just looking for computer parts, but to repair some sort of alien craft? Is it possible? Yes. Is it likely? Probably not. Is it very fun to speculate on the internet? Absolutely. Number two, Victor Goddard. Royal Air Force Commander Victor Goddard was an RAF flying ace with a storied career. Having flown through missions in both the First and Second World Wars, and also possibly flew through a time vortex once. Don't worry. I'll explain that. In 1935, Goddard was serving during the Second World War, flying a fairly routine mission. He was sent to check out the status of an abandoned Scottish airfield in the unremarkable village of Drem, east of Edinburgh. Sorry, Drem. If we have any Drem viewers, just know that the article I was reading for information called it unremarkable, not me. I would never say that. Goddard flew over the field, and he reported back to HQ that Drem was as unremarkable as they described. I'm so sorry. The airfield was abandoned, desolate, grass overgrown over what remaining buildings still stood, populated mostly by free-spirited cows, who were grazing on grass and serving no masters. Circling back around, Goddard found himself caught in a storm that had been passing, causing him to panic for a bit and fight for control of the craft. He circled through, and as he'd exited the storm, he saw something he could not comprehend. He looked back down and found himself completely frozen in fear. Reporting back once again, he noted that the airfield he'd flown out to was completely restored. There were four biplanes in the hangar, and the cows had all been replaced with a staff of mechanics dressed in blue uniforms. The planes on the field were all painted bright yellow, unlike the usual drab silver of the RAF at the time. Goddard was beyond confused. I mean, can you blame him? Had he uncovered a secret base? Was he looking at the enemy? An ally? Was any of this even real? After a few loops around, Goddard found himself caught in the storm yet again. And this time, as he exited, he noted that the airfield had returned to its default state. Desolated, destroyed, once again populated by cows. The incident shocked Goddard to his core and haunted him. He tried to write about it in a biography about his life called Flight Towards reality, but he never got any good answers about what he saw. Perhaps most confusingly about the whole ordeal is that what he reported seeing, the blue coveralled mechanics and yellow planes, would end up being the standard service wear for the RAF a few years after the incident in 1939, when the Drem airfield was also reconstructed. Is it possible somehow 
somehow that Goddard managed to slip forward in time a few years. Was he caught in a vortex? Was the cloud perhaps some sort of unbelievable extraterrestrial technology that he was simply swept up in something larger than himself? Or was the whole experience a product of too much coffee before a mission and not enough sleep? Number 1. Mike Markham In the best movies, time travel is perfected by one lone scientist working around the clock in a garage tirelessly, perhaps just a little bit off of his rocker. Now, Don't think I'm passing judgement at all here. The best leaps in technology have been made by men who were more than a little bit off their rocker. Enter Mike Markham, who in 1995 claims to have cracked the code for time travel with stuff he had lying around the house. He was a 21 year old electrical engineering major who loved building gizmos at home. But his magnum opus was a device he called the Jacob's Ladder, which was a personal time machine that could send a human being backwards or forwards in time. Now I can't even begin to parse the explanation for the machine, they didn't hire me for my brain. But if you go hunting after this video you'll be able to find some detailing how the machine works. But what I can tell you is that it was constructed from a laser from inside a CD player and a continuous arc between two poles. Again, I, I don't know how this works, I'm just reporting the facts. Markham claimed that his device was capable of generating such energy that when he threw a piece of sheet metal into it, it disappeared and reappeared seconds later. Which sounds terrifying. I don't know if I want to be on a time machine that's reconstructing me enterprise transporter style. There are just way too many accidents involved with stuff like that. Unsatisfied with just a piece of sheet metal traveling through the time stream, Markham set out on seeing what would happen if he hooked Jacob's ladder up to a massive power grid and stole six transformers from a local station. This experiment would cause a blackout in the neighborhood, leading to Markham's arrest. Now He would spend a few months in jail, but the incident garnered enough local attention that Markham became a bit of a local hero, and was stunned to discover that after his release, there were offers from aid from pretty much all over, from people offering to donate supplies, money, time, you name it. The people want to time travel. With all the newfound aid, Markham would spend the next two years working on the Jacob's Ladder Mark II, having now rebuilt it to accommodate the size of a person. Updates from Markham would end around 1997 though, when he vanished from the public eye and the world at large. He missed a meeting with his parole officer, and when police responded to try and track Markham down, they found the warehouse that he was using as his personal workshop, but they didn't find him there. They just found burnt up machines, damaged electronics, and singed walls. So did Markham's machine work? Well maybe when he comes back from time, he can tell us. And that's all for this video my ghouls and goblins. Thanks for time traveling with me to the end of the video, and I'll see you in the next one.